We haven't really spent much time on disorders of cognition yet, so in this Brainwaves Brief, we're going to talk about memory. In particular, one disorder that severely, rapidly, and often reversibly impacts memory. In 1881, a German physician by the name of Karl Wernicke described the first three patients with acute confusion, ophthalmoparesis, and ataxia. This was before the days of PubMed, Ovid, and Google Scholar, so his case series was slipped into the middle of a textbook on neurologic diseases. In his previously unreported series, Wernicke described one patient with pyloric stenosis who allegedly presented after sulfuric acid ingestion and uncontrollable emesis. This is Dr. Erica Mejia while the other two patients suffered from a more commonly recognized risk factor for this condition, chronic alcoholism. Ironically, this report came out the same year one U.S. state, Kansas, outlawed all alcoholic beverages. Anyway, these three symptoms, acute encephalopathy, ophthalmoplegia, and ataxia, became recognized as the three main features of Wernicke's encephalopathy. As a historical tangent, six years later, a Russian psychiatrist named Sergei Korsakov would describe the clinical entity in exquisite detail, which he named psychosis polyneuritica. Unfortunately, neither Korsakov nor Wernicke would realize these are related conditions, and 20 years later, the similarities would eventually be recognized, and the eponym would be amended to Wernicke-Korsakov syndrome. Technically, Korsakov syndrome is the consequence of thiamine deficiency that results in a disproportionately greater memory impairment and unlike Wernicke's encephalopathy, does not respond to thiamine replacement. By the time your patients reach clinical attention, the clinical manifestations may be as subtle as those seen in early Alzheimer's disease or could be as obvious as a coma. The progression of symptoms may occur in any order, with several days or weeks of ataxia, followed by confusion, ophthalmoparesis, or they could manifest initially with confusion and then progress towards symptoms of ataxia and nystagmus. A rule of thumb to remember here is a rule of thirds. One third of patients may only have one third of the triad of symptoms and one third have all three manifestations. But nearly 20% of all patients meet zero criteria, so you really have to be looking for it if you expect to make the diagnosis. In addition to this clinical triad, one accepted definition of Wernicke's encephalopathy incorporates the risk factor of a nutritional deficiency. If you meet two of the three original criteria along with malnutrition, this is sufficient for the diagnosis of Wernicke's. In recent years, the nutritional deficiency is less classically attributed to chronic alcoholism and more often the result of bariatric surgery, two to eight months postoperatively. It can also be attributed to protracted emesis, as in cases of pyloric stenosis, chemotherapy or hyperemesis gravidarum, AIDS, magnesium depletion, and with some pharmacologic agents. Erbulazole and ifosfamide have been implicated in thiamine deficiency states, even with normal serum thiamine levels, suggesting that these chemotherapies may act by inhibiting thiamine function in neuron metabolism. Now, you'd think it'd be easy enough to prevent thiamine deficiency. The body only requires 1 to 2 milligrams of thiamine per day, one one hundredth the amount found in thiamine supplements, but there are two problems. First, the human body is physically unable to synthesize this vitamin, so it must be obtained from exogenous sources. Second, the body can only store about 18 days worth of thiamine at a time. And most of it is stored in the liver. Therefore, less than one month of the typical tea and toast diet is just enough to tip a healthy person over into encephalopathy. Let's move on to the clinical manifestations. The most frequently observed finding in all cases is that of cognitive impairment, which you see in 90% of cases with clinical findings. Again, recognize that none of the three criteria may be observed in up to 20% of patients. Most often, there is global confusion and some degree of lethargy. Along with the observation of truncal and gait ataxia, the patient may appear intoxicated with alcohol or other sedatives. In addition, the patient will be highly inattentive, forgetful and unaware of how or why they arrived in your emergency room and why you may be asked as a neurologist to see this patient. There are components of anterograde and retrograde amnesia with or without confabulation. Thiamine replacement, always before any carbohydrate-containing fluids, will quickly improve the attention of these patients. And obviously, glucose administration is contraindicated, as it may accelerate the metabolism of already depleted thiamine stores. Ataxia, by comparison, takes longer to recover following thiamine administration, and about 60% of patients are left with a slow, wide-based gait. 
Among the oculomotor findings, a gaze evoked in nystagmus in both horizontal and vertical planes is perhaps the most common. Less frequently, there may be signs of a sixth nerve palsy, or impairment in conjugate movements, or even a combination of these findings. A misdiagnosis of intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, or Paranaut syndrome, has been made in prior reports, but often neuroimaging with MRI will be more indicative of acute thiamine deficiency, as we'll discuss in a minute. Ocular motor disturbances typically improve within days of thiamine replacement. In addition to these central findings, you will also find signs of a length-dependent axonal polyneuropathy in 80% of patients. This could be related to chronic alcohol ingestion as much as it could be related to the thiamine deficiency itself. You see it more commonly in Europeans as it's recognized in cases of dry beriberi. However, this neuropathy is not sufficient to explain the ataxia endured by these patients. More often, in patients of Asian descent, a cardiomyopathy is observed, the wet beriberi variant. While the diagnosis is presumed clinically, several diagnostic tests may be useful while treatment with high doses of thiamine commences. Obviously, low serum thiamine levels would be expected, but the level of a red blood cell transketolase, which utilizes thiamine as a cofactor, could also be reduced. This test is currently falling out of favor and serum thiamine levels are being obtained more rapidly. The CSF profile is normal or may show a mildly elevated protein, usually less than 100 mg per deciliter. CT scans are pretty much useless, but should be considered in patients where you suspect an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, brainstem or midbrain hemorrhage, bilateral subdural hematomas, or any other intracranial process that could mimic Wernicke's. MRI features are insensitive on the order of 50 to 60 percent, but they can be more than 90 percent specific. There's often T2 prolongation in the medial dorsal thalami, the mammillary bodies, paraaqueductal gray, hypothalamus, and superior vermis of the cerebellum. Rarely the cortex and splenium of the corpus callosum can be involved. Non-alcoholics with thiamine deficiency are more likely to have the atypical lesion locations of the cerebellum and cortex. Resolution of the MRI findings within two to four weeks usually accompanies the resolution of this disease. But in patients with persistent vegetative states, the MRI is more likely to show signs of a progressive cortical atrophy. And obviously, if you get to this point, autopsy could be confirmatory. Historically, as many as 20% of patients with Wernicke's died during their hospitalization, often as a result of comorbid hepatic disease or sepsis. Postmortem studies of patients with Wernicke's encephalopathy confirmed the bilateral and often symmetric pinpoint hemorrhages of the nervous system where MRI changes are observed. Acute and chronic lesions demonstrate subtle differences, with acute lesions being more hemorrhagic and chronic lesions demonstrating astrocyte swelling, microglial activation, and small vessel proliferation. The differential diagnosis for Wernicke's is broad, which is why it's usually a safe bet to start the empiric thiamine treatment at 250 to 500 milligrams three times daily for three to five days while ruling out these other life-threatening disease states. A top of the basilar infarction will produce nearly identical clinical manifestations with MRI changes. Miller-Fisher syndrome, characterized by ophthalmoparesis and ataxia, can be distinguished from Wernicke's by the presence of areflexia. However, both conditions may have reduced or absent reflexes as you see in thiamine deficiency neuropathy. Multiple sclerosis, West Nile or Listeria robencephalitis, CNS lymphoma, and a number of other inflammatory or demyelinating conditions should also be considered. Alright, we're going to try to wrap this one up early. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Brainwaves today. If you like what you just heard, you can find more related material on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or contact us at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our iTunes archive for older episodes. This episode was produced by Jim Siegler. Music by Ars Sonor. Join us next time for another edition of Brainwaves. <laughs>